morning. My name is Phil Howard, and uh, my family and I have been at Hope for the past seven years. I currently serve on the safety team, and I also work with Hope Youth, and I also work as a greeter. So um, today, uh, if you will stand for the reading. Our passage is Galatians 6, 11 through 18. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Phil, for that. And uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to Hope Fellowship Church, uh, where we are passionate about uh, helping people to become and belong through loving God, loving others, and making disciples. My name is Matthew Cogswell, and I am uh, the Next Generation Pastor here, and I'm honored to be with you on this beautiful Sunday morning, right after uh, Thanksgiving. I uh, hope you guys had a, a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, I got to spend some time with family and friends, right? And of course, gobbled till you wobbled, right? I, mean, it's that. I heard the expression uh, earlier about that. But um, as you can tell, we are, um, we're, you know, it looks like Christmas around here, right? Um, some of the, the lights are kind of going in and out. But we, we started to uh, decorate uh, our campus for the Advent series, and we're excited about that and for um, our series next week with uh, the Advent the gift of the incarnation. It's going to be uh, just a, a really great, great time. But before we get into full-on Christmas mode, we've got to wrap up Galatians, right? This is the closing, the official closing of Galatians. Somebody was talking to me earlier, like, you know, wait, how, how many parts do we have so far? And it's like, all right, this is the closing. This is the last one um, before we get into uh, our Advent series. But um, uh, I'm super excited. Last week, uh, Pastor Mark, man, he really, um, he just, just kind of recap, um, really challenged us all, uh, really through the scriptures as we talked about sowing and reaping in the context of, uh, of relationships, right? And, uh, and we, uh, we talked about what does it look like to, um, to be able to step into uh, somebody's mess when they're kind of trapped by sin. And uh, how many of you guys like the G.I. Joe uh, illustration, right? He almost got his, his legs cut off. Pastor Mark tested that beforehand. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go check it out on our website. Um, but it was, it was just a, a really, um, just a powerful and challenging way to set us up for the conclusion this morning as we're digging into uh, uh, Galatians 6, 11 through 18. And the bottom line as we uh, hit home on this this morning is actually a question. And the question is this, are we a people marked for show or marked by the gospel? And to start things off, I've got to uh, give you a test, right? How many of you guys like a test? Huh? No, none of you guys are like, I want a test. But we got to give you a test. Um, here's the test. we got uh, three baskets of uh, fruit here. Uh, two of them are decorative, and uh, one of them is the real deal. And so your job is to point out the real one. And if you guess right, you get an Amazon gift card. I'm just kidding. No, you don't get an Amazon gift card. You, but... We'll, we'll see. All right, so um, first one here. It's kind of hard to see. You get a, little, get a little bit lower for everybody to see. It's a little awkward basket, but just take a look. Which one? Real or fake? Real or fake? Okay. 
We got another one getting low. So you can see, real or fake? Real or fake? All right. I think there's a show, actually, about this with, like, cakes and food. Real or fake? Real or fake? All right. So, who thinks it is basket one? Basket one. Basket two? Basket three? You're all wrong. I'm just kidding. No, no. We'll find out um, what it is, like what's the, the real uh, fruit here at, at the end of the message. But why do I start off with this uh, goofy test? Well, it's because um, uh, the Apostle Paul concludes this letter just the way he started it, by distinguishing the true gospel from the false gospel. Distinguishing himself um, from these Judaizers, these legalists um, who preached uh, the, the Jesus plus circumcision. And for the past uh, many weeks, uh, we've been able to uh, have uh, Pastor Mark and, and Pastor Nate just be able to teach us what this really looks like in context. And it's been challenging. It's been hard, right, to kind of get into the, to really get into the culture aspects of what was going on at that time. Um, but uh, I think that we started to get um, really um, the heart of what's being said here. And, and the Apostle Paul, man, he is, he, he, he's like, I'm just going to uh, conclude this really, really hard. Um, and he does so by picking up, picks up the pen, right? Verse 11, it says, see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Now, some of you are like, well, isn't he writing this with his own hand? What, do you, what does he mean by that? Well, Paul had a helper, right? He had, he had a secretary who wrote down um, this letter and as he dictated it. And um, Paul wrote the final words, however, by his own hand. Now, there's a lot of different things that go along with this, um, with commentaries uh, talk about how maybe um, the Apostle Paul had um, uh, some eye uh, damage, or that there is some sort of ailment there, and so um, maybe that's coming into play, but, um, but Paul would, would, would do this um, at, to kind of adding like a postscript, like a PS to a, a printed Letter And it also served to uh, verify that this was a genuine letter from the apostle, not a forgery. Um, it's not something new, and, and some of his other letters, he does the same thing. But there's a, a difference here in uh, the closing of Galatians uh, that, that kind of distinguishes it more so. Because why he, he really lays out a lot more in this closing remarks than just grace and peace be unto you. What he does is he lays out three points um, in his closing remarks, that, again, that distinguishes himself from the Judaizers and the one true gospel. The first point that he hits home on is this, that the true gospel leads us through the cross, not around it. The true gospel leads us through the cross and not around it. Verse 12 says, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be what persecuted for the cross of Christ and we're going to kind of sit here for a little bit we got to answer the question first what does it mean to make a showing of the flesh the word flesh it had different expressions in the Bible. One refers to the, the sinful nature. Pastor Mark talked about it a couple weeks back ago, the works of the flesh and, and how it's our, our, our sinful nature wages war against the Spirit of God as Christians. And remember, we had those big green fists coming at each other. And, uh, and so that's one expression of that word flesh. Another one refers to the human body like we use the term today, flesh and blood. But what Paul's referring to in this is the same way he uses the word flesh in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. Let's take a look at it. It says, For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3, in context, Paul was writing about how his Jewishness didn't give him a leg up in the kingdom 
combating a form of Jewish supremacy in the Philippian church, and it's the same thing he's saying to the Galatians here at the end of this letter. So here, the word flesh is simply your ethnicity, it's your racial, cultural, and or national identity um, and history. It's the language that you speak, it's the, the food that we, that we eat, the, the thousands of little customs that order our life in a particular way and place and distinguish you from other ethnic groups. So this isn't innately an evil thing. This is not a, a bad thing, right? It's not, a, it's not a bad thing, although we can see how we as, in our sinful nature, can turn it into a bad thing, an evil thing, right? Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but in this case, when we elevate our cultural ethnic distinctions over the true gospel of Christ, well, then there's a problem. And so Paul is saying, He's saying that to the Judaizers, he's saying what they're doing is that they're saying that, that salvation is not um, by, by, by faith and, and the grace that is expressed through the cross of Jesus alone, but it's, it's that plus circumcision that took place in the Mosaic law in the past, right? And, and, and what was happening is they were doing that because there was this religious and cultural uh, war that was going on. There was people that were uh, in the legalistic uh, Jewish elite that were persecuting those. Or they, were, they were persecuting them for, for not being circumcised. And, and they were trying to play both fences is what Paul is saying, that, that, they're, that they uh, don't want to be persecuted for the cross of Jesus. And Paul says, no, 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 no. The true gospel doesn't go around the cross. It goes through it. It goes through it. Listen, the message of the cross is offensive, as we've talked about in previous weeks. Galatians 5.11, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Persecuted. What is the definition of persecuted? Because this is the backdrop of kind of the, the, the finale here, and, and as Paul <clears throat> writes here in Galatians. So I like what Todd Nettleton uh, from The Voice of the Martyrs, he's a it's a ministry that's uh, for those who are persecuted all around the world. Does, they, they do some incredible work. But he simply defines it as this. He says, persecution is having to pay a price for your faith in Christ. Having to pay a price for your faith in Christ. So Christian persecution is when you're either bullied or punished in a manner designed to cause you to suffer because of your Christian beliefs. This could be physical, it could be verbal, it could be social, it could be political. And we don't have to seek out persecution, right? We have to seek out persecution or suffering, but, we, but, but, but listen, uh, if the gospel is truly what we are following, the reality is we're going to have people that are going to come against us. It's just a reality, as Paul is saying. And now, I feel like I need to make this point to balance out this truth of the cross being offensive because I think that at times, um, people can use that as an excuse to say, kind of just be rude right, to people. The cross is offensive, so I'm just going to be offensive. Doesn't quite work that way, right? Doesn't quite work that way. I, I remember I heard it said this, that um, if people hate you because of Jesus, that's expected. But if people hate Jesus because of you, that's a problem, right? Right? There's a problem. So I, I think it's important to balance that out here. But, but we need to understand that when we authentically follow Christ, as Paul is saying, the cross, what we stand for, it will be offensive, the gospel will always lead us through the cross, not around it. Point number two, that he distinguishes himself from the Judaizers and what he preached is that the Judaizers were branded for show. They were branded for show. Verse 13 says, For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, 
but they desire to have the circum- you circumcised so that you may boast in, they may boast in your flesh. So what is he doing? He's called them out for being hypocritical, right? He's saying, so, you know, what was happening is that some of the Judaizers were emphasized circumcision as proof of holiness, but were ignoring other Jewish laws. They weren't even living up to the, the whole law themselves. And, and so they picked and choose which parts of the law that they were going to um, elevate as important and others that were going to uh, ignore. Don't you just hate that? <laughs> right? I don't know if you've been there before, right? You've been in where it seems like a certain sin is being elevated over another Right, something is being highlighted and, and, and we forget and we neglect something else. It's like at least stay consistent in your heresy, right? <laughs> right? Like at least stay, stay consistent in it. It's like when people may condemn drunkenness, but they ignore gluttony. Or, you know, people despise sexual immorality, but tolerate prejudice and racism. Right? You, you, can't, you can't play them both. It's just... And that's what the Judaizers were doing. They were, they were highlighting circumcision, 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 but they were forgetting other things. And it was just like, Paul's like, look, they're not even practicing it themselves. Practice what you preach, he's saying. But again, for the Judaizers, it wasn't about truly living for God. It was about a religious show to them. It was. They wanted to boast in the flesh, he says. That word boast, he uses is an interesting word because uh, in the Greek, this boasting, it means to burn with a glowing iron or to supply with a branding mark. And you're like, what is Paul talking about here? Well, he's using this intentionally. Why? Because in the background stands at this time that the custom of branding slaves and criminals with a hot iron. And among the Greeks, branding was mainly a punishment for runaway slaves. And what Paul is saying is, hey, look, all they want to do is brand you like a bunch of cattle, a bunch of animals, just so that they can boast about winning a convert. And it's just about a bunch of show for them. And he's, and he's, he's calling them out And again, it goes right back to where he talked about earlier in Galatians, where he said, man, why are you you, um, uh, forgetting the true gospel and then taking upon a yoke of slavery, right? So he's using this word intentionally to to really just hammer home the distinguishing. He's like, look, they're they're just branding you. This is just all for a, a, a show, And he goes right back to the the third point here, which says that the cross, he says, the cross, when it should really brand you, it should brand you for transformation. Verse 14 says, but far be it from me that I boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I unto the world for neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Man, what is Paul saying here? What is he speaking to the Galatians? What is he speaking to you and I? How, how could he boast about the cross? He could boast about the cross because he knew the person of the cross. It wasn't just some symbol to him. He, he knew the person of the cross. He boasted in the crucified and risen Savior. He wasn't glorying in the suffering that took place of the cross, but he was glorying in the person of the cross, the one who willingly went to the cross to bear the wounds and to bear the shame and to bear even death on a cross for you and I. He was boasting about the person. And if you remember Paul, who was Saul, on his way to persecute the Christians, he encountered this risen, resurrected Jesus. As he was going to murder Christians, persecute Christians, Jesus, the person of Jesus, showed up and knocked him off his high horse. 
It was, it was the person of the cross that Paul could boast in, that he could, he could say that. Also, he could boast because he knew the power of the cross. The message of the cross in 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. See, in Paul's day, the cross was an acute piece of jewelry around the neck. No, it was, it was the most shameful way to die. In comparison, it was like putting an electric chair around your neck and kind of walking around with that. A little different perspective than how we see the cross and how people walk around with the cross today, right? It was, a, it was, a, it was a, this... Very, it was just, you don't talk about the cross at the end of those days. You don't, you don't talk about it. It was so shameful. It was so, it was so, it was so um, uh, uh, just countercultural. It was, it was so pervasive, and, and it, was, it, was the, it was the cross. You don't talk about it. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm not going to run away from the cross. I'm going to boast about the cross. Why? Because he knew the power of the cross. The power Paul knew that there was no resurrection power unless you have the cross. What Jesus accomplished at the cross through his death, burial, and resurrection was power to combat the powers of this world. 1 John 2.16, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and a pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. Paul says, I've been crucified unto this world and the world unto me. It's those things that weigh us down as followers of Christ when we, we live in a, in a world that normalizes Sin and disordered desires, and they we're constantly bombarded with that. We're confronted with subtle cultural pressures and overt propaganda. And the only way to escape these destructive influences is to be like Paul as he prayed, May I be crucified unto this world and this world unto me. The cross, I'm going to boast in it. I'm not going to run from it because it's the power of God. It's the power that we need as followers of Christ. And lastly, he knew the purpose of the cross. The purpose of the cross. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Listen, you cannot meet Jesus and stay the same. You, join, you can join a church you can, and remain unchanged. You can believe all sorts of things with your head and remain unchanged. But when you meet the risen, resurrected Christ, it's transforming and it's permanent. You can't, you can't encounter the, the true gospel, the true gospel of Jesus, and not be changed. Yes, we 100% and I love about our vision and vision, uh, mission of, of hope of helping people to become and belong, right? And we talk about a journey. There's a journey in this for sure. We can't, we can't just say, oh, everything's going to be great. Once you accept Christ, everything's going to be great. It's going to be smooth. No, there's a journey that takes place. And we honor that, and we walk through, and we love through that, and we endure that. But if we're not being transformed by the cross of Jesus, what are we doing? If it's, if it's not doing something inside of us, if it's not transforming us, if we're not becoming a new creation, what is happening? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone who is in Christ Jesus is the, the new creation has come, the old is past, the new has come. He was saying the heart of the gospel to the Christian walk, it does not consist in circumcision or uncircumcision, some outward religious show or, uh, and our being in this or, or that denomination as Christians, but it consists in our being new creatures not in having a new name or be putting a new face, but in our being renewed in the spirit of our minds and having Christ formed in us. This is the greatest 
account with God. And so it was the Apostle Paul. New creation. Man, if, if we, man, uh, I can, I can, uh, I can test with this as, as Pastor Moore, for Pastor Mork and for all of us as staff, we love the opportunity to come and, and to gather. We, we love the opportunity to have lights and different things and be able to worship together. We love the privilege to be able to break bread together. We love those opportunities. But if we're not seeing people transformed, becoming and belonging, then what's the purpose? What's the purpose? New creations, becoming and belonging. Paul says, if we really walk by that, mercy and peace be upon you. Mercy and peace be upon you. Mercy which contrasts the legalist, mercy, which can contrast that, that we uh, are uh, constantly have to work for God's uh, approval, work for his, for this righteousness, work to, to kind of put on a face uh, so that we can earn um, some acceptance. He said, no, 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 the gospel, when we truly live according to this rule, mercy and peace will be upon you. Mercy and peace to be upon you as you live this life. Mercy that we so desperately need, living in a broken world, having a broken, sinful nature, and having a very real devil that is coming after us. We need mercy and peace. And and Paul says, man, it can't be found in this gospel that the Judeas were preaching. It's not going to be found there. And so I keep hearing from this passage is, man, it's the question, it's the bottom line is, are we going to be a people marked for a show or marked by the gospel? Verse 17, he says, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. What marks is he talking about? What marks? 2 Corinthians 11 24 through 28. This is what he talks about, about his marks. He says, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been I've been in labor and uh, I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure of me and my concern for all the churches. Who is weak without me being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weaknesses. Man, this is the hammer. Paul, who contrasts the legalists with the legalists, it's, it's plain to see as you contrast them both. He says, the Judeans want to mark your flesh and brag about you, but I bear in my body the brands of the Lord Jesus Christ for his glory. What a rebuke. In other words, if your religious celebrities have any scars to show for in the glory of Christ, then let them show it. Otherwise, stop bothering me. Stop, show, stop, stop bothering me. They got marks. They got marks. They're, they're branding. Okay, okay. I got some marks too. I got some marks too. But the difference is they weren't willing to stand up for the gospel. They weren't willing to go through the cross. They weren't willing to be crucified unto this world and the world unto them. It's a rebuke to the Judaizers of his day, but you know what else it challenges? It goes against our comfortable Christianity. It does. It does. That comfortable Christianity that you and I have to wrestle with as followers of Christ in South Carolina, the Bible Belt, <laughs> right? 
in actually in the reality of just the United States, we, we've been blessed to have um, uh, laws and protection for us and for our faith to, ex- to express our faith, right? Um, but uh, we also know that, man, uh, that there's some signs and some things that happen that kind of reveal to you maybe, maybe that's not always the case, right? What happens when we don't have that freedom? We may see glimpses of persecution here, but the reality is that there are many brothers and sisters who are currently dealing with the hard realities of persecution in following Christ. And as I was kind of being challenged by this and just thinking about this, I began to look up and just like persecution around the world. What does that really look like? And again, it's just challenging me. And I saw this one video. I was like, you know what? I got I to gotta really, I got to show this. I got to show this video for you. I'm just going to check it out. All over the world, there are people who risk everything in following Jesus. I remember being challenged by a girl called Fatima from Saudi Arabia. She was in her mid-twenties and living in one of the most hostile places on earth to be a Christian. She'd not always been a Christian. In fact, she started life as a Muslim. And then through a period of searching, she actually became disillusioned with faith and and chose atheism. She said that a lot of her friends would say, the Bible references Muhammad. And so what she did was she spent hours researching the Bible. And she said, no matter where I looked, I couldn't find any reference to Muhammad. But she said, the one thing that I did feel as I read the scriptures is that God was near me and that the evidences and the information presented was true and intact. It wasn't long after this that Fatima began blogging, began getting online and writing blogs for for her friends to read. She wanted to share her newfound excitement for God. As a measure of safety, she would do it under an alias called Rania, which translated means contented. To protect her from the multitude of insults and responses that she would get to her writings about Jesus, I remember on one occasion she received the following reply to one of her blogs about Jesus' love for the Saudi people. And it says, You worship a foolish, crucified, cursed Lord. We are not honoured by Saudi Arabian Christians. If I had you in my hands, I would slaughter you twice. Fatima responded with this. May the Lord Jesus guide you and enlighten your hearts to those who become Christians, how you were so cruel. And the Messiah says, blessed are the persecuted. And by God, I am unto death a Christian. It's this kind of faith and this kind of lifestyle that challenges me to the core. It's a bold, unashamed, a risk-taking faith. And as I think more and more about this idea of risk-taking Christianity, I ask myself, is there any other form of Christianity? Or is Christianity in and of itself risk-taking? It wasn't long after this series of blogs that Fatima decided to tell her family that she'd become Christian. You see, she said that she was sure of one thing, that they needed to know about Jesus Christ. When she told them about her decision to follow Jesus, an argument broke out amongst the family and it became heated very quickly. And the next day, Fatima returned from a family function to find that her brother had broken into her room and was actually sitting on her laptop. This troubled her greatly because she knew that the desktop picture 
was a picture of the cross. And she knew that many of her writings and blogs were sitting open on her desktop. She said when she walked into her room, her brother was very angry. Fatima decided to lock herself in the room as a measure of safety. And she jumped online and she wrote a blog to her followers and it it was simply entitled, I'm in big trouble. Over the next four hours, she asked all her followers to pray for her. But she also was able to write these incredible words. Jesus Christ is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Shortly after this, Fatima's brother returned to her room. He burned her face. He burned her back. He cut out her tongue. And he killed her. her own brother. You know, as I think so much about her story, I I think to myself, what's my response? I think to myself things like risk-taking Christianity. Is there such a thing? Because the Bible that I read, the, the Bible that I see, and here, in the stories like Fatima, they tell me that Christianity in and of itself is defined by risk. It's defined by stepping out of comfort zone. It's defined by courage and hope. You see, it's easy to be a Christian in your head and all, sort of honour God with your words. But being a Christian in your heart and with your actions, that's the real deal. A a Christian in the deepest fibre of your being. It's where faith, it comes alive and it materialises from faith into action. And your natural response to a relationship with Jesus is to express it any way possible. I don't know about you, but that challenges my comfortable Christianity. That challenges it to the core. Just like Paul was challenging and is distinguishing about this gospel, this gospel that he was willing to bear the marks of Christ for, this gospel about freedom, this gospel that transforms heart, this gospel that uh, allows us to, to walk in uh, the light and in relationship with God and the mercy and the peace of a relationship through Christ. It's, it's a gospel that we must preach. It's a gospel that is worth enduring persecution. Otherwise, it's not the true gospel. I asked myself, I was writing my journal, is there anything worth dying for? Am I worth, I'm like, man, that's a hard question. Man, I'm like, man, I'm like a, trying to enjoy the Thanksgiving meal as I'm writing all this and just kind of thinking about, it. I'm like, what, what, Lord? Like, what are you saying? What are you speaking? And, and here's the deal. We may not be experiencing this type of persecution right now, but this story is still happening in places right now. And this story should convict us and give us some resolve this morning. Have you been ridiculed because of your faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you been ghosted by some friends because of your convictions? Have you had to endure hardships? Can I tell you, you're in good company. It's going to be hard to live out the faith at times for sure, but is it worth it? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So how can we tell if we've been marked for a show or marked by the gospel? I think it's when pressures come. When we begin to be tested. When trials and tribulations come. How do we respond? What what happens when we're tested? Is there fruit? Are we producing fruit as it talked about uh, uh, this this fruit that is contrasted with the the fruit of the works of the flesh? Is Is this fruit, is this gospel that leads us to producing a fruit of love. It gives us courage to be able to step into our neighbor's mess when they have sin and to be able to lovingly speak truth and love to them. It's the gospel that leads us to be able to serve one another. It's the gospel that truly transforms that we can see people becoming and belonging through loving God, loving others, and making disciples. Why don't you bow your heads and Pray with me as we just give an opportunity for uh, those who may have been here during this series for the whole time, or maybe it's just this morning, and you, you have been convicted with the reality that your faith, this walk with God has looked more like a show that it does the real deal. And you, and you know that deep down in your heart, you have not truly trusted in the gospel. You have not truly trusted in the finished work of the cross. You're, you're maybe still trying to work for his uh, righteousness and trying to work for his approval. You're trying to still work for the, the things that God has freely given through his son. And if that's you this morning, I'd like for you just to go ahead and lift up your hand unashamedly, boldly. I see that. And I want you just to pray with me. I say to you, Jesus, my life has been more like a show than the true gospel that you died for. May you transform me from the inside out. May I be a new creation for your glory. May I live this out for all of my days knowing that it's your your peace your mercy that sustains me through the cross in Jesus name and with every head bowed and eyes closed and everything right now I want I just want to also give an invitation right now for those you may you just recognize, I know I'm a believer, I'm a follower of Christ, I I know I'm a child of God, but I'm just kind of stuck in this comfortability Christianity. Maybe I'm stuck in maybe people pleasing. Maybe I'm stuck in this, uh, this fear of people. Maybe I'm stuck in uh, compromising my convictions for for the cross because of how much pressure I'm receiving from this world. Can I just tell you, God wants to meet you right where you are and to sustain you. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Yes, I see the hands. I see that. I want you to pray with me. say in the name of Jesus I recognize that I have fallen short 
And right now, I choose by the grace that you have given me to take a stand for the gospel. Lord, I pray that you empower me by your spirit to live for you. God, may you be glorified through everything I say and I do. Help me to be crucified unto this world and this world unto me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand to worship. Sing this with us. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, and for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ. is dark. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my plea, His power is the sway.
Hey, thanks for joining us today and spending this time with us. Before you leave, would you take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel or go on Facebook and comment there so that more people have the opportunity to hear this message. Also, if you'd like to further engage, go to our website at hopeandanderson.com and subscribe to our newsletter as well. We'd love to see you on campus sometime. Our services are at 9 and 11 a.m. And we would love to have you here in person. So again, thanks for your time and have a great day.